1991, newly qualified nurse Beverly Allett murdered four children at Grantham and District Hospital. In a case unheard of in the UK, she purposely set about attacking those in her care. Her reign of terror left families torn apart by the deaths and numerous other children seriously injured, making this a crime that shook Britain. Many of the youngsters who survived her attacks at Grantham Hospital were left severely mentally and physically handicapped. For someone to be arrested for a murder is quite horrendous, but she, it was absolutely nothing to her, no emotion whatsoever, no fear, no anxiety, nothing. One thing to say and that's I want to know how she got the job in the first place. She should never have worked in that hospital, never. Beverly Alec was left alone with her for a few minutes and called out that the child was blue cyanose and had stopped breathing. Alarm over what was happening in the children's ward at Grantham Hospital surfaced in spring 1991. The sudden death of seven-week-old Liam Taylor was a first in a series of suspicious deaths or mysterious collapses. Beverly Allett hurt these children in order to gain some, some kudos, um, something for herself. She becomes Britain's most prolific female serial killer this century. I believe she is nothing but a cold-blooded murderer. Beverly Allett was employed for her role to care and protect. She did the exact opposite. Behind the facade of her nursing duties, she set about callously killing those who couldn't protect themselves. Child after child was collapsing on the ward. Her colleagues and the families were unaware they had a cold-hearted killer amongst them. She got the job on the children's ward because they were grossly understaffed. Many of the parents in those early days spoke quite highly of her. So much so that the Phillips family made Beverly Alec godmother to one of the twins. Somebody that worked hard on the ward, was always keen to volunteer, would change shifts at the drop of a hat and were friendly towards parents. The crimes committed by Beverly Allett will be told through the eyes of those closest to the tragedy. Ward 4, Grantham and District Hospital. Five-month-old Paul Crampton has been on the ward for three days, having been admitted with a bad chest. The doctor had uh, asked for him to be admitted to the hospital just, just to keep an eye on him, really. And I think they, they described him at the time as a happy wheezer. So he clearly had a chest infection. And whilst we were concerned that he was in hospital, we weren't really worried. It, was, it seemed to us quite precautionary. He seemed quite happy. And clearly that was the right place to ensure that this chest infection didn't become any more serious. Paul Crampton was admitted under Dr. Porter with what was considered to be a respiratory illness called bronchiolitis. He was on regular treatment for his breathing difficulties, but he wasn't ill, and he was getting better. Parents were happy. I felt that he could be discharged home sooner rather than later. But as Paul is given his routine drug treatment,
and uh, that it was just a matter of removing the pellet. Surgeons had taken him to the theatre, removed the pellets, and after recovery from the anesthesia, was transferred for further recovery to the paediatric ward. As Michael makes a steady recovery, Beverly Allett becomes one of the nurses taking care of him. Then we were assured that uh, everything was fine and perfectly normal and that he would, you know, very rapidly recover because it was only a very minor operation. But two days after Michael's admittance, horror strikes. Suddenly Faye got a phone call to say, get up here straight away. Michael's in trouble. And uh, asked for an explanation and he said, well, he, he's blacked out and he, he was arching his back and just collapsed on the bed. During the course of his treatment, he'd been injected about six times with a particular sort of drug. And on the seventh occasion, when he was being injected with it, he cyanosed, went blue and stopped breathing. Doctors fight to save his life. Meanwhile, Beverly Allett continues her duties, having just prepared Michael's antibiotics for his latest injection. Michael had had a cannula in his left hand since the day before and had had several injections through it and been perfectly calm. So why would he suddenly have an anaphylactic shock at a needle on the second day being put into a cannula, not stuck into him? I found he was shaking, making unusual jerky movements of his limbs. He was breathing hard and heavy. His heartbeat was dropping and virtually dropping to almost zero. I then called for extra help, gave first aid measures, provided oxygen, but within a few minutes he recovered and became stabilized. As Michael lies very poorly at Grantham, Paul Crampton is now making a quick recovery at another hospital. And I remember asking to see the um, consultant that was responsible for Paul's case, and he said, you can take Paul home. I said, well, how can we take Paul home then? Because, you know, we don't know why he was ill in the first place. In the end, I did take him home quite late one evening without any real answers. As Paul leaves hospital, against all odds, Michael also pulls through. The reason for their collapses remains a mystery. In the space of seven weeks, eight children have suspiciously collapsed on Ward 4. Some now lie dead, and the consultants have no medical explanation. Now, since Michael's decline, three more boys have suspiciously collapsed. All had been admitted with minor complaints, but were shortly found on the brink of death. Somehow, they are saved by staff again. The doctors are now in a race against time. Is there a common thread? A vital clue to the mystery is about to unfold. The results from Paul Crampton's blood finally arrive. Dr. Porter had received the results of Paul Crampton to suggest that he had very high insulin levels in his blood in some of the samples. We had a meeting, myself, Dr. Porter and Mrs. Moira Onions, to discuss our continuing growing concerns about these collapses, which were unexplained and unexpected. So we did sit down and put our thoughts together and collated whatever information was available. As the doctors hold an urgent meeting, a 15-month-old little girl, Claire Peck, is admitted to Ward 4. She came in with no more than an asthmatic attack. She'd been in hospital the week before. On this particular occasion, she didn't respond to the usual treatment. So it was decided that she would be taken down to the treatment room. Claire's condition is deteriorating rapidly. As preparations are made, Beverly Allett is left watching her. Beverly Allett was left alone with her for a few minutes and called out that the child was blue cyanose and had stopped breathing.
Ward 4 at Grantham and District Hospital is in a crisis. Over the last few weeks, too many children have been falling gravely ill for no reason. And now, as the doctors call an urgent meeting to get to the root of the problem, another baby collapses. Beverly Alec was left alone with her for a few minutes and called out that the child was blue cyanose and had stopped breathing. One of the other nurses worked on her and managed to recover the child. Staff managed to bring the baby girl round, but their efforts are short-lived. As Dr. Porter leaves to talk to the parents, Beverly Allett is left to care for the baby once more. And he's astounded within, when within minutes the shout goes up that this little girl stopped breathing again. So he goes back and he works on the little girl for some considerable time. And to quote his words, he said to me, it felt as if there was something preventing me saving the life of the child. Later in the evening, I heard from Dr. Porter that Claire Peck, who actually was under my care previously for the current episodes of us. Understanding of medicine and procedures uh, and in those early stages I, I suppose it, it, it's fair to say that there is an element of fear in uh, when you realize what it is that you're going to take on. Detective Superintendent Clifton needs a medical expert to study each case. 
officers have to see if there are grounds to dig deeper. Have these children been murdered? The findings come as a surprise to some. David Hull was asked by me to be my expert, to look at the case files of the children and to provide for me a report which would either suggest that a crime had been committed or that these collapses were something that was a natural occurrence. But his report into the 13 cases that he looked at suggested that of the 13, 10 were natural causes, two others were unexplained and worthy of, of further investigation but would probably be down to natural causes, and one child there was no clinical explanation and was worthy of further investigations. That one child is Paul Crampton, now safe and well at home but his blood test could hold the key to unravelling the deaths on Ward 4. There were over 40,000 millionits per litre of insulin in, in this child's blood and in fact I think it's the second highest ever recorded in the world or it, it certainly was in 1991. The uh, police officer from Grantham Police Station came into my office with a lady and he said that she was a representative of Grantham Hospital and then he told me that um, he had reason to believe that Paul's illness was a result of the maladministration of drugs. And I remember precisely what I said. That would explain a lot, wouldn't it? So for the very first time, now this is 10 or 12 days into the inquiry, we have some evidence that somebody has poisoned one of the children using insulin. Fortunately, the doctor who admitted Becky took blood. And again, we managed to trace that blood and have it examined. And that uh, was found to contain almost 10,000 milliunits per litre of, uh, of insulin. So here was a second child that we could actually show had been poisoned with insulin. Blood samples are now showing massive levels of insulin. Have some of the children been poisoned? This is now a major investigation. Everyone involved is questioned. My role at the time was to go with other officers to Ward 4 at Grantham Hospital to speak to nurses, doctors, parents of the children at the hospital, anyone really, because we were in the process at that stage of gathering as much information as we could to try and establish what had happened and if indeed any criminal offences had occurred. At the same time, one of the PCs working within the incident room was plotting who was on duty or who was available on the ward at the time of each of each of these collapses. An event, who the patient was, what date the event occurred on, who was the nurse involved in any treatment, were any injections given and if so by whom. And as a consequence of that it became apparent that one nurse stuck out as being there when these incidents either occurred or immediately that the child collapsed. Okay. Four children have died and nine collapsed on Ward 4. It all started ten weeks ago. What began as unavoidable tragedies have now turned into something much more sinister. Police have been in a race against time. After weeks of detective work, they now have their culprit. The turning point and the shock of the news that the cause of some of the collapses was someone had been harming children became apparent around four weeks or five weeks later when the police felt that insulin had been administered to Paul Crampton very likely by one of the nurses in the ward and that was a great shock. My first reaction was a bit of relief because you know I was frightened that we got a son that had got a medical problem that was something that was going to affect the rest of his life. Of course, then there's another problem to deal with, that you now realise someone's been trying to harm your child. Strangely, as police investigate Ward 4, the attacks stop. And after a few weeks, all the evidence leads to one person. The chart showed that on every occasion that there was a child collapsing, Alec was on duty. It didn't specifically identify uh, individual children that she dealt with but it just showed what happened on the dates and times that she was involved in holding the fridge key for instance. So three weeks into the inquiry I decided that I would have Beverly Allett arrested. 
As 23-year-old Beverly Allett becomes the main suspect, she shows little emotion. Four children now lie dead, and a further nine seriously injured. She showed no emotion whatsoever. She certainly didn't appear to be worried, nervous, anxious, agitated, nothing. She gave absolutely nothing away in the course of the interviews and gave me nothing at that stage to suspect that she'd committed any of these offences. During those two days of interviews, she answered questions but distanced herself from the events, often saying, I wasn't there then, I wasn't even on... Months of frustration for the police finally end with a result. Six months on, Beverly Allett is arrested once more, never to step out of custody again. That arrest was peculiar in, in the sense that she was charged, went to the cell, immediately fell asleep and had to be woken the next morning, which I found rather astonishing for somebody that was going to face some horrendous charges in, in, in court the following day. It was absolutely nothing to her, no emotion whatsoever, no fear, no anxiety, nothing. One of the times that she was at the police station, I actually went um, and saw her in the cell and she lifted her top because she'd lost quite a lot of weight and she was sort of saying, oh, I've lost weight, do you think I look better and all this, as if we were on lost friends. And elements of Beverly Allett's true nature and personality now start to filter through. <laughs> and her medical background, even going back to the days of school, 
were of a child that came with plasters and bandages and slings and things that normal kids just wouldn't. She complained that she couldn't pass water and she was admitted to the hospital at Peterborough. It was clear that she had urine retention and that she had a temperature. What concerned the staff at Peterborough Hospital was that her pulse didn't rise when she had a temperature. And eventually they concluded that what she was actually doing was warming up the thermometer. When she complained of pain in the breasts, they examined her quite closely and found needle tracks and concluded that she was actually injecting her own breasts with water. While she'd been on police bail, she'd been living with a family called Jobson down at Peterborough. And Beverly struck up quite a, a nice relationship with Jonathan Jobson. One particular day they were going off to the market and before they went, Beverly made Jonathan a drink of squash. When he got to market, he complained of feeling quite ill and collapsed. He was taken into Peterborough Hospital where it was concluded that he had a, a high insulin count. There's a whole host of lies and manipulation of, of people. Beverly Allett's trial is long and complicated. Eventually, after months of evidence, she is charged with four counts of murder and nine attempted murders for attacking the children on Ward 4. She is given 13 life sentences and shows no emotion and no remorse. I saw her at Rampton Hospital about three or four weeks after her transfer there. At that time she made admissions in respect to nine of the 13 that she'd been convicted of. She wouldn't admit that she'd been in, involved in any way with the two Phillips children, but undoubtedly she was. Some of them will never know what, precisely what she did. This admission of guilt is a small window into Alex's psyche, but she was never to speak of the attacks again. I don't want to talk about it. Why she opened up, we will never know. And as for the motive... Post-conviction, there were reports from a number of people that suggested that she was suffering from Munchausen syndrome. Now, Munchausen syndrome is a, a syndrome where people like to get attention. In other words, they're attention seekers and they'll do anything to, to gain attention. When it moves on and you cause injury to somebody so that you get attention as the carer, it becomes Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I think it is very unfair for anyone to label her as suffering from Munchausen syndrome because that virtually minimizes her horrendous criminal actions she carried out as criminal who is cold-blooded, calculating, deceptive, manipulative, and deadly. Beverly Allett's case was the first in the UK where a nurse was linked to killing due to Munchausen's by proxy. Whether this is partly the reason the fallout from this horrific crime is clear. Shortly after news broke, the hospital, its staff and patients became victims of the fallout. Ward 4 was quickly closed, facilities moved to a nearby hospital and the two main consultants made redundant. When they found that Beverly Allard could be charged with these allegations, they wanted to hand over the paediatric services to Queen's Medical Centre. They, they closed down Ward 4 at the hospital and removed all the services to Nottingham. I think that was an overreaction, but that was the decision of um, the regional medical authorities. Um, I think it did a disservice to the people of Grantham. The Clothier report shortly followed. An inquiry into how and why this tragedy occurred and whether it could have been prevented. We did not and could not believe that we could have a criminal amongst us masquerading as a healthcare professional. So my message is, think of the unthinkable. He made about seven or eight recommendations out of the total 13 recommendations on recruitment and selection process of nursing. I sincerely believe it should 
not only apply to nurses, it should apply to all health care professionals. Within this inquiry, the reason that, that people were never sure whether, whether there were crimes committed was because all of the notes that, that were made up, and there, there, there were countless, there were nursing notes, there were, there were doctor's notes, there were notes from physiotherapists and what have you, were always based on what Beverly Allett told them. Beverly Allett callously murdered those who needed her care. Sadly, four children needlessly lost their lives. The nine who survived have thankfully recovered. Paul Crampton and Michael Davidson had no lasting side effects. Allett felt no remorse or shame for her victims and thrived on the attention of those who trusted her the most, parents and colleagues. She played them so well, they never suspected her sinister intentions. Which begs the question, could this happen again? All you can hope to do is to identify the people that have the potential for doing this sort of thing. In various guises, there are Beverly Allets all over the place. There needs to be much more rigid vetting procedures of staff entering into the service and much more rigorous and careful monitoring of staff who are actually on the job. I accept that isn't going to stop every case. You know, you're never ever going to do that if somebody is determined enough to ever try at it. But at least every one case that is prevented is one case that we can be thankful for. If we move Bevan Allett from the picture and consider this to be some kind of some new book, some new superbook, some kind of faulty drug, uh, a batch of drugs that have been badly prepared, the results would have been the same. It's about the hospital's ability to deal with a developing crisis. And the well-meaning medical staff were not prepared to deal with that. That wasn't part of their training. They deal with ill people, not a pattern of unusual circumstances, which in this case was caused by Beverly Allard. I was satisfied that uh, Miss Allard would be convicted on the basis of the evidence. The fact that she still remains in prison, I think, is, um, is fair. She has committed atrocious crimes on most vulnerable and helpless children. I believe she is nothing but a cold-blooded murderer. I sincerely hope and wish that I nor any health professional will ever come across anybody like Beverly Allert ever in their life. And there's one thing I am very certain of, is Beverly Allert should never be free. qualified nurse Beverly Allett murdered four children at Grantham and District Hospital. In a case unheard of in the UK, she purposely set about attacking those in her care. Her reign of terror left families torn apart by the deaths and numerous other children seriously injured, making this a crime that shook Britain. Many of the youngsters who survived her attacks at Grantham Hospital were left severely, mentally and physically handicapped. For someone to be arrested for a murder is quite horrendous. But she, it was absolutely nothing to her. No emotion whatsoever. No fear, no anxiety, nothing. One thing to say and that's I want to know how she got the job in the first place. She should never have worked in that hospital. Never! Beverly Allett was left alone with her for a few minutes and called out that the child was blue cyanose and had stopped breathing. 
Alarm over what was happening in the children's ward at Grantham Hospital surfaced in spring 1991. The sudden death of seven-week-old Liam Taylor was a first in a series of suspicious deaths or mysterious collapses. Beverly, Alec, her time as a happy wheezer, so he clearly had a chest infection. And whilst we were concerned that he was in hospital, we weren't really worried. It, was, it seemed to be quite precautionary. He seemed quite happy, and clearly that was the right place to ensure that this chest infection didn't become any more serious. Paul Crampton was admitted under Dr. Porter with what was considered to be a respiratory illness called bronchiolitis. He was on regular treatment for his breathing difficulties, but he wasn't ill and he was getting better, parents were happy. I felt that he could be discharged home sooner rather than later. But as Paul is given his routine drug treatment, these children in order to gain some some kudos um, something for herself she becomes Britain's most prolific female serial killer this century I believe she is nothing but a cold-blooded murderer Beverly Allett was employed for her role to care and protect she did the exact opposite Behind the facade of her nursing duties, she set about callously killing those who couldn't protect themselves. Child after child was collapsing on the ward. Her colleagues and the families were unaware they had a cold-hearted killer amongst them. She got the job on the children's ward because they were grossly understaffed. Many of the parents in those early days spoke quite highly of her. So much so that the Phillips family made Beverly Alec, godmother to one of the twins. Somebody that worked hard on the ward, was always keen to volunteer, would change shifts at the drop of a hat, and were friendly towards parents. The crimes committed by Beverly Alec will be told through the eyes of those closest to the tragedy. Ward 4, Grantham and District Hospital. Five-month-old Paul Crampton has been on the ward for three days, having been admitted with a bad chest. The doctor had um, asked for him to admit him to the hospital just, just to keep an eye on him, really. And I think they, they described him at the time.